Welcome to the Afternoon History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel, and it is Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021, and we are live. Some of you heard the intro there from 910 AM, the Superstation, where they have some excerpts of uh, me speaking <laughs> over Snap. I've got the power. I need to get a copy of that. <laughs> I need to get a copy of that. That's good. That's a good promo. That's imaging. That's what they call in the radio business imaging. So, <laughs> well, look, it's uh, been a very, very busy day today. And uh, I was working on uh, content for the show on top of a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so on today's show, uh, today is August 3rd. August 3rd is Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Now, we always celebrate African-American women and Black Girl Magic and things like this, right? Black Women's Equal Pay Day <laughs> is not necessarily something to celebrate. We need, we need to understand it and help correct it. But it, it ain't, it's not really something to celebrate. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a legacy of white supremacy and slavery, okay, <laughs> and discrimination. So what is Black Women's Equal Pay Day? Well, Black Women's Equal Pay Day is the day that uh, African-American women, it marks the day that African-American women uh, the following year make the same amount of money that the average white male made the previous year. OK, it takes the average African-American woman 20 months to make the same amount of money that the average white male makes in uh, 12 months. So the average African-American woman makes uh, 63 cents on the dollar. Uh, and, you know, in our working lifetime, there was a, a study. There's an article from BlackEnterprise.com um, from, I think, a couple of years ago. And we'll pull up this article. It deals with how the average African-American woman uh, loses about a million dollars in her working lifetime. OK, loses about a million dollars in her working lifetime because of the racial wage gap, because of the racial wage gap. So there are a number of articles today being written about this. Fortune.com has an article. NBC News uh, has articles on this. Now, I, I, talk, I deal with um, black women's equal pay day every every year uh, is usually like the first or second week of August. And the amount uh varies uh some some years is 63 cents some years is 67 cents but this impacts not just african-american women but african-american men and african-american family and community so this is something we should all be concerned about uh there's an article from fortune.com why black women's wage gap is a problem for everyone why black women's wage gap is a problem for everyone on tuesday the average black woman will find will we'll have finally earned the same amount as the average non-Hispanic white man earned a year earlier, eight months later. That's a problem, not just for black women who lose out on $900,000 in lifetime earnings, but for everyone, says experts on equal pay. But for everyone, says experts on e equal pay. Well, it, 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 everybody loses out, period. OK, you don't have to be an expert on equal pay. You just have to understand how the economy works in a consumer based economy. Uh, so we'll talk about black women's equal pay day. And being um, speaking of black girl magic, Simone Biles returned to uh, Olympic competition uh, early this morning. And I went to bed. It was something like 445 in the morning in Tokyo when the balance beam competition uh, started. I went to bed like 4.30. I recorded it. I, I haven't had a chance to go back and record. It's been so busy today. And, you know, as as we reported yesterday, um, historian and anthropologist and, and lecturer and prolific author and a friend of mine, Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Renoko Rashidi passed away uh, August 2nd, 2021, passed away yesterday. He was in Egypt, given a tour in Egypt and passed away from a heart attack. So we're dealing with that and um, you know, this is just been, it's just been a crazy couple of days. Tony Browder reached out to me the day I, I hit Tony Browder up yesterday. Um, and, and, uh, Tony and, uh, Renoko have done lectures together. Tony posted information about, uh, Renoko passing and everything. So, um, 
I'm going to reach back out to Tony because I want to get him on the show again. But um, Simone Biles, uh, Simone Biles won a bronze medal in the balance beam. And I, I went to bed about 15 minutes. I, I, I was tired. Uh, I went to bed about 15 minutes before the competition started. So I recorded it. I said, I'll go back and watch it. Um, so she won a bronze medal. And, you know, and, and, and everybody was happy for her. Well, most people, not, not, uh, I guess not a lot of the critics, but uh, <laughs> most people were happy for. Her. So we're going to discuss that as well. Um, Simone, uh, uh, Simone Biles returns and wins bronze on the balance beam. And she also talked about uh, part of what was causing her to have the mental blockage. She also talked about what was going on in her personal life that caused her um, problems as well. So we'll discuss that. And, and then uh, we'll talk uh, some more about the passing of uh, Renoko Rashidi. Brilliant, brilliant brother. You know, Tony uh, uh, said, you know, he's irreplaceable. Tony Browder, when he sent me a message this morning, he said Renoko is irreplaceable. And I don't know, out of all the scholars I, I, I know and have known and have interviewed, and I was going through my archives today, I, I pulled up an interview that I did with Renoko, uh, uh, the one I was trying to get from 2017 when I interviewed him here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. I, I got to find that one in the archives. It wasn't playing um, correctly uh, from Blog Talk Radio. So I pulled up an interview that I did with him from 2014. We're going to share an excerpt of that because that deals with the Black Madonnas, the uh, the statues of the Black Madonna and child in, in Europe. And it deals with the uh, African presence in, in Europe and the Moors and things like this. Um, so uh, I don't know any other scholar uh, like Renoko. And uh, of all the scholars I know, I mean, he, this brother's been to uh, about 135 or more islands and countries. I'm looking at his bio right here on his website, drrenoko.com. And um, uh, it says 124 countries, but I think I think um, it's about 135 now. I think it's at least 135. And um, I would see him uh, sometimes in Atlanta at the uh, Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo. Um, Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo uh, in Atlanta it takes place usually the third weekend in July in Atlanta. And he spoke there at least, uh, I think, a couple of times. Um, shout out to Queen Thais, who uh, organizes that. And also, I would uh, see him here in Detroit periodically when uh, Minister Malik Shabazz would uh, bring him uh, to Detroit to speak. And I think that's when I first met him, okay, years ago, maybe 2010, something like that, years ago. And then uh, we know in about 2012, I think it was, he was in uh, Hidden Colors 2 when H Hidden Colors 2 came out. But uh, brilliant scholar. So we'll talk some about uh, uh, Renoko. And Renoko connects us to uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema because he was a student of Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. Uh, so a lot of people are shocked and reeling and mourning the passing of uh, historian and anthropologist and scholar, uh, lecturer, prolific writer. He wrote books. He wrote articles. Uh, Renoko Rashidi. OK, so we're going to deal with those topics on today's show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions. 
because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Did I say relationships? Hopefully I did. Relationships. Um, sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, the sign up for our email newsletter also. Uh, you can still register for the a 10 week online course that I teach the new 10 week online course that I teach. This is on Saturdays, 3 PM to 5 PM Eastern standard time from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power, 1865 to 1968 from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power, 1865 to 1968. Okay. And, uh, this is a 10 week online course. We do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it uh, over and over again, even after the course is over with. You can go back and uh, watch it over and over again. Each class, we go through and analyze an approximately 10 year period of history after the Civil War ends. And we start in 1865. But I gave a recap of what uh, what led up to the Civil War starting in 1861. In each class, we go through and analyze an approximately 10 year period of time to understand what happened uh, to us after slavery ended. What happened to us after slavery ended? What happened during Reconstruction? Why did Reconstruction end? What was Reconstruction? We take you through that period of time and the Compromise of 1877. Um, which ends a period of a lot of advancement for African Americans, the compromise of 1877 between the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, we take it through the Jim Crow era and a, a reversal of our rights and uh, a escalation of the imposing of the black codes and things like this. And then go into uh, the, the, the 20th century, go into the early 1900s and uh, uh, World War I, 1914 and 1918, the Great Migration, 1915 to 1970, World War II, 1941, 1945. What, hap what happens after World War II, then the civil rights movement and the black power movement. Okay. So this is a fantastic course. Uh, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, uh, visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, we have the information right on the homepage and then, uh, click on, uh, click on register here. It takes you to the next page. And click on enroll class is regularly 130 dollars it's on sale uh 80 as soon as you register there's bonus content that you can start watching okay as soon as you register there's bonus content that um you can start watching also and then you'll be ready for class on saturday uh 3 p.m to 5 p.m eastern standard time uh you can watch from around the world you can use this also with your children i would say the information is like pg-13 you can use this with your children as well. Okay, we're going to post a link here, uh, right here on the thread of the broadcast. So you can register for the course and you can also visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and register there as well. All right, we're coming up on a break. Um, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, WFDF. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by, everybody. Stand by. Stand by. Okay, we just posted a link there. Hold on. We just posted a link. You can register for the online course. Stand by. We'll be back from break in uh, four minutes. Stand by, everybody. One commercial break. Stand by. All right. Yeah. Uh, also, if you want to support the African History Network, 
uh dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app and also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show hey stand by Stand by, everybody. Stand by back from breaking a couple of minutes. Stand by. All right, welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is uh, Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021, and we are live. All right, calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a, a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the calling number. If you have a question or comment, I just sent you a clip. Uh, Shakita, cue that up. It's for us about Black Women's Equal Pay Day from uh, Morning Joe, please. Thank you. All right. So, as I said at the beginning of the show, uh, today is Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Now, a lot of people may celebrate, oh, it's Black Women's Equal Pay Day. It's something great. And, well, <laughs> we should uh, study it, but it ain't really something great. It's, it's because of white supremacy and racism. OK, um, so each year I talk about Black Women's Equal Pay Day and Black Women's Equal Pay Day marks the day that uh, it takes the average African-American woman to make the same amount of money that the average white man made the previous year in 12 months. It takes the average African-American woman 20 months to make the same amount of money that the average white male made in 12 months. Uh, if we look at this article here from NBC News, Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Black women work 579 days to earn what white men do in 365 days. Now, for all the people to say, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and uh, try harder and all this, that ain't how you did it. I mean, we could deal with the history. Uh, read this book right here. How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy. That's not how you did it. August 3rd, Mormon's Equal Pay Day. Or the day black women must work into 2021 to finally catch up to what white non-Hispanic men earned in 2020. Author Minda Hartz, M-I-N-D-A, Minda Hartz says companies now have a unique opportunity to even the playing field. Companies have a unique opportunity to even the playing field. Uh, uh, now, over the last year, women have left the workforce in unprecedented numbers as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And if, 
And if you are African American or Latino, I don't like use I don't like black or brown, African American or Latino, or Latino woman, chances are you have fared even worse. This year, Black Women's Equal Pay Day falls on Tuesday, August 3rd, and it means Black women must work an extra 214 days, must work a two uh, extra 214 days to catch up with what white non-Hispanic men made in 2020. Across industries, Black women are paid only 63 cents for every dollar made by white men, according to the National Women's Law Center, 63 cents for every dollar made by white men. So when see racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. OK, racism is is a, is a power structure. Racism occurs when one, one race of people control the majority of wealth, power, resources, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, media, jobs, etc. And they use that to marginalize, subordinate and do harm to another race of people. Uh, so this is this is a real life uh, effect of this. OK, this is a real life effect of this. Now, there was also uh, a good article from Black Enterprise that we're going to go to here in just a minute. And I cite this a lot in some of my lectures and things like this. And, you know, when I when I speak across the country, I, I talk about black women's equal pay day. And I'm surprised how many African-American women don't know about black women's equal pay. And I said, wait a second. Hold on. You're a black woman. How is it you don't know about this? So. Let's remember that the workforce was not equitable in many industries for women of color, even prior to the pandemic. And the groups that are often hit the hardest during a crisis tend to take the longest to recover. Despite the challenges that many women of color face in the workplace, the lack of sponsorship, upward mobility, upward mobility barriers and the wage gap. Uh, uh, Minda said, I'm optimistic about our future. I'm optimistic about our future. Minda uh, hearts. Now, companies and organizations now have a unique opportunity to play a vital role in even in evening the playing field for women of color. Uh, number one, it, they can have more inclusive hiring practices, more inclusive hiring practices. Only one in five C-suite executives at Fortune 500 companies is a woman, according to the 2019 McKinsey study conducted in partnership with leanin.org. And for women of color, it's even more isolating with just one in 25 in C-suite roles. Uh, despite this current reality, there's good news. Companies can change and implement hiring practices. Companies can change and implement hiring practices that center on um, African-American women and Latino women that have not been prioritized in the past. I'm not suggesting preferential treatment. What I'm recommending is for companies and organizations to be intentional, to be intentional about having uh, having a diverse slate of candidates for all future positions at every level. Uh, in addition, a diverse hiring committee should be formed to participate in the interview process. So much bias happens during the hiring process. So much bias happens during the hiring process. And by modifying current hiring practices that might skew heavily to one demographic, gender or race, implementing an equitable hiring framework will inevitably benefit the recruitment and advancement of women of color. Uh, next, we have pay transparency, pay transparency. As we mark Black Women's Equal Pay Day, it should be a rem reminder to all companies that they must work to find an equitable solution. The answer is simple. It won't happen if companies don't prioritize equal pay for women. It won't happen if companies don't prioritize equal pay for all women. 
the first a first and important step is for all companies and organizations to conduct annual or quarterly pay audit reports and make them available to their employees. Between 2016 and 2020, only 22 percent of companies reported performing salary audits. Only 22 percent between 2016 and 2020, in that four year period of time, only 22 percent of companies reported performing salary audits, which can be used to assess any differences in pay related to gender and race. If we want to recruit and retain women of color, then we have to make sure there are no signs of wage theft practices. OK, now, if we look at this article here that I talk about often. Uh, this is from 2019, October 2019. This is uh, from BlackEnterprise.com. Black women lose out over $1 million in their careers thanks to the wage gap. Black women lose out over $1 million in their careers thanks to the wage gap. This is from October 17th, uh, 2019. This impacts not just African-American women, but African-American families and our community. Um, in, in the article, it says uh, a black woman will lose out on nine hundred and forty six thousand one hundred and twenty dollars, nine hundred and forty six thousand one hundred and twenty dollars. OK, uh, over a 40 year career, if she continues to make 61 cents on the dollar. That the every that 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 every white man does every white man earns due to the wage gap. This was an analysis by the National Women's Law Center. Okay, um, the press release stated, assuming the press release stated, assuming she and her white non-Hispanic male counterpart begin work at age twenty. A an African-American woman would have to work until she is 86 years old. An African-American woman would have to work until she's 86 years old to catch up to what a white non-Hispanic man has been paid by age 60. So if it, this, the average African-American woman loses out almost a million dollars in lost earnings due to the wage gap, not because she didn't do the job, OK, is due to the, is due to the racial wage gap. She loses out almost a million dollars due to the racial wage gap. That's money that could be used to pay off student loans. That's money that could be used to buy property, start businesses, help uh, put your put your children through, put your children through college, buy stocks, all different types of things like this. It's not that uh, she didn't do the work. It's not that she did like 63 percent of the work. No, she did 100 percent of the work, but she got paid 63 cents on the dollar. The National Law Center found that black women face even a, a even larger pay disparity in certain states in the state of Louisiana, which has one of the highest poverty rates in the country, by the way. And that's where Angola prison is also Louisiana. In the state of Louisiana, black women are paid on average 47 cents. For every dollar their white non-Hispanic male counterpart makes, 47 cents on the dollar, which is the worst state for black women's wage equality. Okay, now this was in uh 20, this is like in 2019, okay, in uh in about right, right around 2019. Now, uh, okay, so read the rest of this article here from Black Enterprise. Black women lose out over one million dollars in their careers thanks to the uh, wage gap. Should say, should say the racial wage gap. This is what it is, the racial wage gap. Now the article goes on to say, cause you know, we know African-American women have the most student loan debt on average out of anybody. And African-American women uh, are, are more educated than anybody. And that's based upon percentage of the population enrolled in college. Is about, when a study came out, 2016 2017 something like that it was about uh, uh nine percent of african-american women were enrolled in college advanced education among african-american women has not been shown to lower the wage gap 
Now, I'm not saying don't get advanced degrees, but let's but we have to look at this here. This is something that people don't talk about. Advanced education among African-American women has not been shown to lower the wage gap. In fact, the gap is largest for the most educated African-American women. The gap is largest for the most educated African, African-American women. Doctorate degree holders who are African-American women tend to make 60% of what their white male counterparts make. Doctorate degree holders who are African-American women tend to make 60% of what their white male counterparts make. Now they don't get a discount on student loans. They don't just have, they don't have to pay 63% of the student loans back or 60% of the student loans back. They have to pay back hundred percent. African-American women have the highest student loan debt of any racial or ethnic group. For an undergraduate degree, the average African-American woman carries nearly $30,400 in debt. $30,400 in debt compared to $19,500 for white men. The wage gap, the, the, the wage gap lessens black women's ability to pay off educational debt creating an additional barrier to saving money that could be used to buy a home, start a business or use for emergencies. So this is what racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. So for all the people, black conservatives, including for all the people want to say, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and try harder. Why don't you tell people to pay, a fair wage to African-American women and African-American men for that matter. See, they don't want to deal with things like this because this is ex exposes the racism. And you have a lot of people who, who say try harder, but they don't want to level the playing field because they benefit from the playing field not being level. All right. I want to go to this clip here. This is from I'm going to go to clip uh, one, Shakita. This is from uh, this is from Morning Joe, MSNBC. Uh, from August 3rd, 2021, um, Tuesday marks Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Uh, August 3rd marks Black Women's Equal Pay Day or the day Black women must work in 2021, the year 2021, to catch up to what white non-Hispanic non men earned in 2020. Author Minda Hartz and journalist Aaron Haynes join Morning Joe to discuss. Let's go to this clip. Take it off mute. Oh, what a night. A good, good night. I mean, Simone. Go, go to the, go to the other clip. Is the second, is this, stop, stop the clip. Is the separate email I just sent you. It has the clip for Morning Joe. Black women's equal payday. That's the clip from Simone Biles. Black women's equal payday. I sent it in a separate email. All right, while we get that queued up, uh, just press play when you get it queued up. There was also an article from um, uh, CNBC that dealt with how black women lose out on almost a million dollars in their working lifetime as well. Okay, uh, that's from uh, CNBC. And we're going to pull that one up. Now, I just posted the link from uh, Black Enterprise. And, you know, when, when I do lectures and I and I share this information with African-American women, I'm surprised how many don't know about this and don't know about black women's equal pay day. So this is something that all now all the celebrities in African-American celebrities, this is something they should be talking about. Let's go to this. clip. Now, I'll allow you to know, exactly, like I said, how much the person sitting next to you is making. Some may even discipline you. For asking that, that has to change. Too often, secrecy is part of the problem. We know information is power. You can't solve the problem if you don't know you're not getting paid fairly. My administration is going to fight for equal pay for as it become a reality for all women. It's about justice. 
It's about fairness. It's about living up to our values and who we are as a nation. Equal pay makes all of us stronger. President Biden speaking on Equal Pay Day back on March 24th. The day represents how far into the year women must work on average to earn what men earned in the previous year. And the disparity is greater for black women. Nearly five months later, today is Black Women's Equal Pay Day, meaning that black women will have to work an extra five months to catch up. Five months. Right now, that's 63 cents for every dollar a white man earns. And caregiving to the mix, add that, and you will find that black mothers make just 52 cents for every dollar a white father makes. The pandemic has only amplified these pre-existing inequities. Let's bring in author Minda Hartz. Her book is entitled The Memo, What Women of Color Need to Know to Secure a Seat at the Table. Also with us, Erin Haynes, editor-at-large for the 19th, a nonprofit newsroom focused on women, politics, and policy. Erin, let's start with you with these numbers. These statistics really, they, they're staggering um, and also demoralizing. What more do you know about the inequity between black women and white men or even black women and white women in terms of equal pay? Yes, I mean, it's just as you said, 579 days uh, black women had to work extra in order to earn what white men earned in 2020. And that is a figure that should be alarming to everybody. Uh, and we're covering this over at the 19th. We've got a story up right now that shows, you know, one report estimating that the executive and management opportunity gap between white women and white men will close in 2041, but predicted that the gap between women of color and white men may not close until 2124, which is 103 years from now, by, by the way. Um, so there's an opportunity gap between white men and all other demographics, but black women and white men have the most significant disparity. And look, the bottom line, Mika, is that black women are doing our part. I mean, we're hyper-educated, we're qualified, and yet this gap persists. And so it's time for everybody who's committed to equity to also step up to help to close this gap. But that's not going to happen until this country starts recognizing black women as equal, worthy of equal treatment in this country. And the pay gap is one way to address this. But the reality today is that this is really part of a much larger conversation about who is reflected, uh, whose values are reflected in this country and how that value is reflected. Jump, jumping off that last point, Minda Hart, uh, how do we solve the problem? How do we even begin to solve the problem in terms of how black women are viewed in the workplace, which then ultimately leads to how they are paid in the workplace? And also, what can black women do uh, to, to help rectify the problem as well? Yeah, good to see you, Nika and Erin. So a couple of things. We really need to focus on what companies and organizations can do to solve this problem. And one of those things is normalizing pay transparency. Between 2016 and 2018, only 22% of companies reported even having salary audits. So we need to normalize transparency and that will help recruit and retain women of color, black women specifically, when we know that there's not demonstration of wage theft practices. Number two, inclusive hiring practices, restructuring and uh, prioritizing black women in the workplace at every level of the company. And that's also including um, having a diverse hiring slate and making sure that the people doing the hiring are reflected of those black women so that they can see themselves in those roles. And lastly, what women of color, I'm sorry, black women can do, we can continue to advocate for ourselves, articulate our value and quantify our work. Make sure that people know what we need and let's build a culture of allies inside the workplace. So if you are a manager, this is also your opportunity to make sure that everyone is invested in on your team. So Mika, jumping in on this really quickly, you worked with the Obama administration. They asked you to, to work with them on transparency, the very transparency that we're hearing about this morning, about, about how, how every company should let people know what others are making uh, in, in their similar positions uh, to, to see through that transparency how fair the pay is. Yeah, no, it was through the White House Council of Women and Girls, headed up by Tina Chen. Valerie Jarrett was involved, and Equal Pay Day was a big deal. It's salary audits 
which companies really push back on for a number of reasons, and also inclusive hiring practices. I talk a lot, Aaron Haynes, about meeting people where they are. Instead of trying to get people to fit into corporate slots that were created years and years ago that nobody really fits into. Yeah. Um, so this is a huge effort. Um, and what we're going to do is continue this conversation. Uh, go to our website, knowyourvalue.com. You're going to hear a lot more from Minda Hart and Aaron Haynes on this incredibly important issue. Thank you both uh, for being on the show this morning, and I'll see you over on the website. Okay. That's from uh, Morning Joe. That's from Morning Joe, uh, MSNBC, August 3rd, 2021. Uh, so check out that clip. Uh, the name of that name of that segment from Morning Joe, Tuesday marks Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Tuesday marks Black Women's Equal Pay Day. That's from uh, uh, MSNBC. We'll post a link here to uh, that clip. And that's on MSNBC's website. Okay, now. Uh, if we look at this one here, this article quickly here from Fortune, then we're going to go to the story about Simone Biles and we'll talk about Renoka Rashidi. Uh, so get the clip for Simone Biles ready because we're going to that next. Why black women's wage gap is a problem for everyone. Why black women's wage gap is a problem for everyone. August 3rd, 2021 from Fortune.com. And uh, in the article, uh, it talks about how for um, black women of whom many are of uh, the primary breadwinners of their households, the pay gap of 63 cents on the dollar represents more than just a loss of money, represents more than just a loss of money, said, says Shannon Williams, the director of Equal Pay Today, a project of um, Equal Pay Today, a project of equal uh, of equal rights advocates experts are reflecting on this wage gap on the date known as black women's equal pay which comes four months after equal pay day the comes four months after women's equal pay day which is largely for white women averaged for all women reflecting the larger pay gap black women face now um Shannon Williams says, quote, the issue of equal pay is not just a women's issue because it trickles down into our family and into our communities and it trickles down into our overall economy. This is what I was saying a few minutes ago. If the uh, end quote, if the gender pay gap were eliminated. If the gender pay gap were eliminated, on average, an African-American woman working full time year round would have enough money for their two and a half years of child care. They would have enough money. Uh, they, they would have money for more than two and a half years of child care, more than two and a half years of additional tuition and fees for a four year public university or 22 more months of rent, according to the National Partnership for Women and Families. So when we deal with the eviction moratorium and we deal with this, this eviction landslide, we, um, this is proportionately negatively impact African-American women and families. To begin to rectify the wage gap between black women and white men, Companies need to make changes to their hiring and promotion practices, uh, says Shannon Williams. Policies such as asking people to report their previous wages or discouraging workers or discouraging workers from sharing how much they are being paid with colleagues can keep in place lower pay for African-American women. Until substantial change is made. Advocates such as Shannon Williams will continue to bring attention to the wage gap, she said. Okay, read the rest of this piece here um, from Fortune.com. Fortune.com, why black women's wage gap is a problem for everyone. Okay, read that one. And then CNBC uh, also has an article from today. Uh, black women make nearly $1 million less than white men during their careers. 
black women make nearly $1 million less than uh, white men during their careers. This is from CNBC.com, August 3rd, 2021. Uh, Tuesday, August 3rd is Black Women's Equal Pay Day. It marks the additional 214 days that black women must work to catch up with uh, what white non-Hispanic men earned last year. In essence, black women must work 509 days to make what white men made in 365 days, okay? Now on average, black women are currently paid 63 cents on every dollar paid to non-Hispanic white men for full-time working African-American women, for full-time working African-American women, uh, this amounts to a median wage gap of $2,900 a month, $24,110 a year, and $946,000 over a 40-year career. So over a 40-year career, based upon the latest statistics, African-American women make $964,000 less. Uh, so read this one uh, also. That's almost a million. Okay. And then uh, African-American men make about, I think it's about 80 cents on the dollar that the average white man makes, that the average white male makes. Black women make nearly $1 million less than white men during their careers. So read this piece here from uh, CN CNBC.com. All right. Uh, I want to go to uh, Simone Biles. We'll go to that clip from Simone Biles. So Simone Biles bounced back. I, I, you know, I was up late. I was working. I was editing the videos, doing work after last night's show. And uh, it was going to start about 4.45, uh, um, 4.45 Eastern Standard Time in uh, in the U.S., in Eastern Standard Time uh, in, in there in Tokyo. And I went to bed about 4.30. So I recorded it. I still got to go back and watch it. OK, Simone Biles bounces back with bronze on balance beam. Okay, let's go to this clip. Savannah, oh, what a night. A good, good night. I mean, Simone Biles. Oh, she did it. Delivered, honey. She did it. It was remarkable. She came into the competition. She got a bronze medal on the balance beam. By the way, SG, that final just wrapped up. I was in the audience with a whole bunch of people who were watching. We were all, it was like we were all nervous wrecks, but <laughs> we got a little video. Uh, we wanted Simone to know that we were there rooting her on, and um, she and Suni were down on the floor. It was really cool. But by the way, SG, right now, they are on their way over here in a van. The whole crew, <laughs> the whole entire team. I hope you got them a police escort so they can hurry, hurry. And I swear I saw, I was watching live, I swear I saw someone look up at you, Hoda. I know she gave you a, a, a wave. Oh, she did. She was so sweet. And I was, you know, she was nervous, but she's going to come here and tell us all about it. She did it. She did it. She did it. All right. All right. So Simone Biles did it. Okay. Stop the clip, please. Stop the clip, please. Okay. Simone, Bi Simone Biles did it. And uh, stop the clip, please. Thank you. So Simone Biles did it. Uh, she won a bronze medal on the uh, balance beam. Okay. And she said, I didn't expect a medal today. I did not expect the medal today. I just wanted to go out there and do this for me. And that's exactly what I did. Simone Biles said after the competition. Now, um, she got a score of a 14. So she took bronze, um, widely considered the world's best gymnast. Simone Biles moved smoothly and precisely through her routine, barely wobbling and smiled broadly as she landed on the mat. Uh, when it concluded, she waved and blew a kiss at photographers and the crowd and hugged teammates and competitors alike. Okay, now, uh, Biles ties, she now ties the record for the most Olympic medals won by a U.S. gymnast. Team USA tweeted shortly after she bagged the, the bronze medal. She scored 14.0. Uh, and here's what you're up here, here on the balance beam. Now, she said, it's been a very long week. 
Uh, it's been a very long five years, Simone Biles said. It's been, it's been a very long week. It's been a very long five years. She said, I didn't expect a medal today. I just wanted to go out there and do this for me. And that's exactly what I did. Now, um, okay, those watching on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting. If you'd like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research and uh, stay on the air and keep broadcasting. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, register for uh, my new 10 week online course from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and uh black power that meets on saturdays 3 p.m to 5 p.m all right um remember right now is correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win we're kind of forever we'll talk to you tomorrow peace stand by everybody stand by all right uh this is our official cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w uh through cash app and it, it will show my name there and say michael so you can support us there uh stand by we're going to keep going we're out of time on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Uh, let's see here. Okay, let's go back to the story here of uh, uh, Simone Biles. So let's bring this back up. All right. If we go back and look at this article here from... Um, Uh, NBC News. So Simone Biles said it's been a it's been a very long five years. It's been a very long five years. Uh, she said, speaking in a gymnastic uh, center after the event, she said, quote, I didn't expect a medal today. I just wanted to go out there and do this for me. And that's exactly what I did. Now, she stunned spectators last week by withdrawing uh during the team gymnastics final she said the emotional toll of the tokyo games not a physical injury prompted her withdrawal she said the uh emotional toll of the tokyo games not a physical injury prompted uh her withdrawal now uh, speaking Tuesday, uh, Bile said she had been evaluated by medical professionals daily. She also had two sessions with a sports psychologist while in Tokyo, which she said had helped ease her mind. OK, she had two sessions with a sports psychologist in Tokyo, which which she said helped ease her mind. And once again, you know, Simone Biles has brought attention to mental health for athletes especially especially for olympic athletes and the need for them to uh pay attention to their mental health and know when they should not compete uh she said then just focusing on the beam since i don't twist and all really helped okay because doing the balance beam is different than doing the uneven bars or something like that or floor exercises. You don't do a lot of twisting uh, as much as as uh, with the balance beam. Now, Simone Biles said that she found out her aunt had recently passed away unexpectedly and that it really hurt. Uh, it, it had been really hard. OK, so this is something we found out today. She's also dealing with the death in the family as well. She found out her aunt, aunt had recently passed away unexpectedly and that it had really been hard. Earlier, she had revealed she was still suffering from the twisties. And she said she literally cannot tell up from down. She literally cannot tell up from down. But there was no sign of any such anxiety as she performed on Tuesday. Now, when she was asked how the bronze uh, medal compared to past medals she said that that it was definitely sweeter that it was definitely sweeter she said i'll cherish this a lot more 
um, she said, I'll cherish this one a lot more. And the Huffington Post had an article dealing uh, with that topic also, and what she said that she would cherish this one uh, a lot more. And uh, we're going to pull that one up from the Huffington Post here in just a second. Um, all right. She said, I'll cherish this a lot more. She said, I, I would like to dedicate it to all the Team USA for helping me and reaching out and supporting me. Is It just meant the world. It just meant the world. Okay, so um, we have that story from uh, NBC News. And then Simone Biles went on to say, um uh, previously she said this uh statement on friday last friday for anyone saying i quit i didn't quit okay and we talked about this uh on yesterday's show for anyone saying i quit i didn't quit my mind and body are simply not in sync as you can see here simone biles wrote friday in an instagram post that'd be friday uh july 30th uh, she said, quote, I don't think you realize how dangerous this is on hard competition surface, nor do I have to explain why I put health first. Physical health is mental health. Physical health is mental health. So check out this uh, piece here from uh, NBC News. Simone Biles bounces back, wins bronze on balance beam. All right. Now, there was a. Uh, there was an article from Black Enterprise that talked about her aunt passing. Uh, Simone Biles' aunt died while she braved pressures while she braved pressures of Tokyo Olympics. Uh, and it says here, uh, in what seemed like the most trying week of her career uh superstar gymnastics greatest of all time simone biles caught a case of the twisties and pulled out of several olympic uh competitions to tend to her mental health before she finally conquered the balance beam and secured uh a bronze medal during the tokyo 2021 olympics and to add insult to injury to, to her injured soul to add insult to her injured soul simone biles was peppered with hate by some who thought she was punking out on the international stage by opting out of competing but in the midst of it all supporters swooped in in the midst of it all supporters swooped in to fill her heart with words of love, support, and courage, okay? But as if that wasn't enough, Simone Biles received the devastating news that her aunt on her father's side unexpectedly passed away, according to People Magazine. Um, Simone Biles' coach uh, said That's, that, was another, that was another one. I was like, oh my God, this week needs to be over. OK, now. Um, and she's and her coach went on to say, and she said, I just need some time. I said you uh, she said her coach went on to say, and she said, I just need some time. I said, you call me, you call me, text me if you need anything. I'll be here, whatever uh, that is. She called her parents. She said, there's nothing I can do from over here. So I'm just going to finish my week. And when I get home, we'll deal with it. End quote. Um, OK, so she's also dealing with the passing of uh, her aunt as well. All right. So it's been uh, a very traumatic uh, two weeks for her but she has paid attention to her mental health gotten help that she needed and she's been able to bounce back and persevere so our condolences to her family as well and um you know she she did a fantastic job on the balance beam 
Now, there was also an article from uh, Huffington Post. It's one from Huffington Post that I saw. And she talked about the importance of this bronze medal and how it was different than the other medals she's won. Now, this is her seventh medal. She ties the record for the most uh, uh, medals for a gymnast. Simone Biles, I'll treasure this one a lot more after everything I have been through. I'll treasure this one a lot more after everything that I've been through. And uh, she says, I was proud of myself. She says, I was proud of myself just to go out there after what I've been through. Uh, she said this after she won the, uh, after she won the brown, bronze. She told that to Reuters, uh, Reuters.com. She told the Associated Press, I had nerves, but I felt pretty good. She said uh, in re uh, regarding the bronze medal, she said, I'll treasure this one a lot more after everything I've been through. Now, the color of the medal seemed irrelevant after uh, Simone Biles with seven medals tied Shannon Miller for uh, the most won by an American gymnast. One of them was a bronze on the beam at the 2016 Rio Olympics. A week has passed since Simone Biles abruptly dropped out of competition after a uh, wonky vault. She spoke frankly of her struggles and the pressure and withdrew from the all around and in, in three of the individual events as well. But she appeared smiling and ready for what could be at least uh, it could be a last moment on the Olympic stage. She said, this one is definitely sweeter, referring to the bronze medal. Here's a picture of her smiling with her bronze medal. All right. So once again, she's black girl magic. And congratulations to Simone Biles. All right. <laughs> Marlene said that haters are going to always hate. Yes, they will. And they can't do one one hundredth of what. <laughs> Simone Biles can do the best they can do is uh, try to tumble out of bed in the morning. That's the best they can do. Half of them can barely sit up in the morning. That's the only sit up they do trying to sit up in the bed in the morning. All right. So read this one here from um, Huffington Post. Simone Biles, I'll treasure, treasure this one a lot more after everything I have been through. All right. Uh, we want to go to this next uh segment here this is dinner with renoka rashidi before we go to that uh everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms invite your friends to tune in as well want to let you know that uh, i have a new uh 10-week online course uh that i teach on saturdays uh this is from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power uh 1865 to 1968 okay and this picks up basically where the uh, first online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, uh, where that one leads off. This is a 10-week online course. We do approximately two hours each session. Sometimes we go, sometimes we'll go over. Um, this is Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. OK, even after the 10 week course is over with, you still have access and go back and watch the course as much as you want to. You still have access to it. Uh, each class will go through and analyze an approximately 10 year period of history after the Civil War ended. OK, and uh, we go through Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, and deal with the Jim Crow era and a reversal of rights and uh, of African Americans and theft of land and attack on progress we were making and uh, the lynchings that took place and um, Supreme Court rulings like Williams versus Mississippi, 1898, which uh, legalizes poll taxes and literacy tests. And we go through 
the 20th century and uh, the Great Migration, 1915 and 1970. And uh, we look at uh, World War One and uh, the Red Summer, 1919, and uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey and creation of the Nation of Islam uh, as well. And, and then we go through World War Two. Uh, 1941, 1945, and uh, the New Deal from Franklin Roosevelt and the, the Civil Rights Movement and, and what happened after World War II as well. And we start having a deindustrialization of the inner city and the expressways being built, running through African-American communities, 41,000 miles of U.S. interstate highways. And they're going to run through about 1,600 African-American communities, wiping out businesses, wiping out homes. Uh, we go through the civil rights movement. We look at Emmett Till um, and the Montgomery bus boycott. We go through the civil rights movement and then through the black power movement as well and the assassination of Dr. King. We'll also deal with the Kerner Commission report. Uh, commission in 1967, July 1967, came out March 1968, the month before Dr. King was assassinated. So this is a fantastic 10 week online course. You can register right now for as soon as you register, you can watch last week's session. And we also have some bonus content there that you can watch as well. OK, um, you, you'll get the uh, first three classes of this other 10 week online course. I teach uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. In this class, we deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place and take you through the transatlantic slave trade. This class meets on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And we do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. So these courses are regularly $130 on sale, $80. And click on register here. It takes you to the next page. Just click on enroll. And um, you can um, click on enroll. And uh, you can uh, register there. As soon as you register, you can start watching the archive content. And you'll be ready for um, uh, classes on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And we just posted the link here also so you can register for, for the courses. All right, uh, let's. I want to talk about uh, Renoko Rashidi passing away. This took everybody by surprise. Um, historian and uh, lecturer and uh, anthropologist, uh, uh, Renoko Rashidi. Uh, uh, Renoko was a friend of mine, and uh, we've had him here on the show before the African History Network show also, even on my blog talk radio show, even before I started doing radio on 9, 10 a.m. in 2016, I had him on my blog talk radio show. Um, and he was a brilliant, brilliant brother. This is a uh, this is a big loss. Let's pull up a picture here. And I want to look at the um, there was an article that I saw today of um there's an article from um the focus the focus news dealing with uh the passing of renoko rashidi then we're going to look at uh um uh, we'll look at the uh bio that's on his website also okay so let me uh go to his website now his website is drrenoko.com drrenoko.com and pull up his website here you can i think you can still order his books through his website uh let me see right here drrenoko.com and i use uh i use two of renoko's books in my online class you know i talk about renoko like every class <laughs> uh <laughs> black star to african presence in early europe is um one of the books i use when we talk about the the the, the history of the moors this is one of the books this is a book renoko wrote fantastic book i interviewed him about this like in 2014 black star to african presence in early europe then also golden age of the moor edited by dr ivan van sertima renoko has an essay in this book fantastic essay dealing with the history of the moors and then also dealing with um asia where is that book um 
And I've got a ton of books here. Got the I have his book on the uh African presence in early Asia as well. And I referenced that book also in my classes. Oh, right here. Now, this one, I think I got this one from him um, a few years ago when he was speaking at the uh, Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo in Atlanta. African star over Asia, the black presence in uh, in the East Africa, African star over Asia, the black presence in the East by Renoka Rashidi as well. OK, so this is a brilliant brother. uh yeah he was in the film hapi okay yeah i just talked to taiki grant yesterday um he was one of the people i reached out to to confirm that uh renoko had passed away taiki is uh the director of the film hapi we've had uh taiki here on the show before all right so if we look at this here here's his website and there's a uh statement from the family here august 2nd 2021 from the family of Renoko Rashidi. Let's blow this up here. And I, I knew he had passed away before I posted, you know, a few hours before I posted about it. Uh, I talked to a couple of people. They said we want to let contact the family and let the family know before we start putting this on social media. So I reached out to people. I talked to Professor Kaba Hiawatha the coming in yesterday. I talked to uh, Professor Jane Small yesterday. Uh, Dr. Ray Winbush, uh, Tony Browder uh, reached out back to me today because I, I contacted Tony yesterday and he got back with me today. And we talked about this uh, some as well. Uh, family, it is with our most sincere and deepest regret that the family of Dr. Renoko Rashidi announced the sad news that he has trans transitioned into the ancestral realm on today, August 2nd, 2021. He was on tour in Kemet, Egypt. Uh, doing what he loved most, he will be greatly missed. Please allow his family the time and privacy needed during this difficult moment. Uh, we will be posting more information and updating this website as it becomes available. Okay. Uh, brother, brother Yasir Rahotep, Brother Vernon, Sister Teresa Dobson, Sister uh, Althea Cooper. Okay. Here's a picture here of Renoko also. Um, let's pull it in. Okay, so they have quotes from Renoko here. That, so they have a bio. Okay, Global African Presence Archives. They have a bio here on Renoko. Let's look at his bio. I printed his bio out also because I wanted to go over that today. Then I'm going to share an excerpt of an interview I did with Renoko from uh, this one is 2014. I'm trying to find the full interview from 2017 that I did here on 19 a.m. I'm trying to find that full one because he was speaking. It was promoting him speaking here in Detroit uh i'm trying to find that full i gotta go through my archives i have over a thousand episodes of the african history network show but um renoko rashidi is an anthropologist let's see how this looks okay let's try to blow this up some more for you all let's see okay let's try to get this up. all right renoko rashidi is an anthropologist and historian with a major focus on uh what he calls the global african presence the global african presence that is africans outside of africa before and after enslavement africans outside of africa before and after enslavement he is the author or editor of 22 books the most recent of which are my global journeys in search of the african presence asada garvey and me a global African journey for children in 2017 and the black image in antiquity in 2019. Okay. Uh, his other books include black star, the African presence in early Europe, which is a fantastic book. Um, it, that was published by books of Africa in London in November, 2011. And then also African star over Asia, the black presence in the East, published by books of africa in london in november 2012 and revised and reprinted in april 2013 
uncovering the African past, the Ivan Van Sertema papers published by Books of Africa in 2015. His other works include The African Presence in Early Asia, co-edited by uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. And we know Dr. Ivan Van Sertema wrote They Came Before Columbus. Uh, four of Renoco's works have been published in French, in the French language. Now, as a traveler and researcher, researcher Dr. Renoco Rashidi has visited 124 countries. Now, I think it's 120. I think it's at least 125 now. They may have to update that but at least 124 countries as a and, and see what renoco did was he took photographs everywhere he went so he had a personal library i think the last interview i did with them he said it was like thirty-five thousand photographs he had taken all around the world documenting the african presence all around the world it may be forty thousand photographs now but it was like thirty-five thousand. And on his uh, um, web, on his YouTube, on his Facebook page, he posts all these photographs. Okay, if you go to his um, here on his website, it should connect you to his uh, Facebook page. Okay, but it's Renoko Rashidi on uh, I think it's Renoko Rashidi on Facebook. Uh, I'll pull that up because I follow him. We're Facebook friends, and he had he has a. Uh, uh, he has the personal page, but he has the fan page. Also, his fan page is, let me see. What, okay. Which one is his fan page? Yeah, this one right here it was 73,000. Uh, it's Renoko Rashidi, but it's a, it's a fan page. Okay. And that's like 73,000. Uh, I think this is the right one. It's like 73,000 friends or followers, something like that. Uh, let me see here. Okay. So, yeah, this one right here. This is his fan page. He's at like 73,000 on the fan page and uh, 73,000 people like, but it's about almost 100,000 to follow it. Yeah. Okay. So check that out. Now, let's go back to this bio. Uh, Renoko has, so he's visited at least 124 countries I, I really think it's 100 at least 135 now uh as a lecturer and presenter he has spoken in 67 countries he's spoken in 67 countries renoco has worked with and under some of the most distinguished scholars of the past half century including dr ivan van sertema dr john henrik clark dr asa hilliard uh, Professor Edward Scobie, Dr. John G. Jackson, Jan Carew, and Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen, Dr. Ben. In October 1987, Renoko Rashidi inaugurated the first All India Dalit uh, Writers Conference in uh, ha uh, Hyderabad, uh, India. In 1999, he was the major keynote speaker at the International Reunion of the African Family in Latin America. In Venezuela, uh, Barlovento of uh, Venezuela. In 2005, Renoko Rashidi was awarded an honorary doctorate uh, degree, his first by the Amin Ra Theological Society Seminary in Los Angeles. The Amin Ra Theological Seminary in Los Angeles. In October 2010, he was uh, first keynote speaker at the first Global Nationalities Conference in uh, uh, in Nigeria, okay, uh, Osagbo, Nigeria. In December 2010, he was president and first speaker at the Diaspora Forum at the uh, Fessman Conference in Dakar, Senegal. In 2018, he was named traveling ambassador to the Universal Negro Improvement Association 
the UNIA and African Communities League, RC 2020. In 2020, he was named the, uh, to the curatorial and academic boards of the Pan-African Heritage Museum. He is currently doing major research on the African presence in the museums of the world, the African presence in the museums of the world. Now, as a tour leader, he has taken groups to India, Australia, Fiji, Turkey, uh, Jordan, Brazil, uh, Egypt, Ghana, Togo, Benin, France, Belgium, etc. Uh, all throughout Africa, uh, Kenya, uh, Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Luxembourg, uh, Germany, Cameroon, Spain. Uh, Renoco's major mission in life is to up is the, is the upliftment of African people, those at home and those abroad, those at home and those abroad. Okay, so uh, visit his website, Dr. Renoco. Dot com. I think they have information there how you can order his books and everything. Support Renoco and his family. This is a big loss. Um, and let's see, let's go back to the home page here. Okay, this is a, so they have updates on uh, his website, drrenoco.com. Okay, yeah, they'll have uh, updates here. All right. Uh, I want to go to now. There was also this article here from uh, the Focus, and somebody sent this to me uh, today. This is written by Olivia Olfen. You can check this out. Also, it talks about Renoco's legacy. Uh, the Focus News dot com, or the Focus dot News, the Focus dot News. Renoco Rashidi's death announced. Academic community mourns scholar and historian. This is by Olivia. Olfen, uh, from August 3rd, uh, 2021. I saw a post, um, Rock Newman and our a Facebook friend saw a post from Rock Newman because Rock Newman has interviewed, um, Renoco before and Rock and he was posting information, uh, clips of like the interviews, etc. So, this is an article here about uh, Renoco. Renoco was 67 years old, he was born in 1954. So, check this out also. Um, from the focus, uh, focus dot news. There was a post here that I shared from Tony Browder. Tony and uh, uh, Renoko were good friends, and they've done like lectures together, things like that. Um, they're also both in Hidden Colors too, as well. They're both in Hidden Colors too, also. Uh, let's see here. Where's that post? Okay, this one right here. Let's see if we can. Um, bring this up here. All right, so we'll do it like this. I posted this on my fan page all right i was trying to get this on tony's page but okay we can do it like this this was shared from uh tony tony browder's page and he made it public, so I can sh I can share it. Uh, Tony Browder said, it "Is a picture of uh, Tony and Renoco together." And Tony and I, we were on a. a well, I've had Tony Browder here on the show before a number of times, and I want to bring him back on uh, for another interview. But we were Tony and I were on a panel discussion together in Atlanta at the second Black Power Awards. I think that was. 2017 i think it was uh, we were on a panel discussion dealing with the film black friday from director rick mathis and director rick mathis was um uh he was the um moderator of the panel and um 
Tony and I were both in, in uh, one of the Black Friday films. But he said, uh, Tony said, uh, I lost my brother, Renoko Rashidi, yesterday. We lost a giant yesterday. As the world mourns the loss of Brother Renoko, let us remember let us remember him as a brilliant scholar who dedicated his life documenting the contributions of African greatness worldwide. And you know, Renoko wasn't one, Renoko wasn't one of the scholars that want to do all these debates and all this stuff on YouTube, and he, he wasn't one that wanted to talk negatively about African people and things like this. Renoko was dedicated to the upliftment of African people. He wasn't, he, Renoko was not for things that divided African people. He was a Pan-Africanist. He was not for things that divided our people. He wasn't into debating over ideologies and all this stuff. Okay. He, and he, he, he used his work to uplift African people all around the world and show us the connection of African people around the world as well. Uh, he said, I share this interview, uh, Renoko and I did on June 20th and asked that you did June 20th, uh, 2021 and ask that you think of him fond fondly and wish him safe passage as he makes his way into the ancestral realm. Peace and blessings to the family of Renoko Rashidi. So that's a post from, uh, Tony Browder. And I shared that on our, uh, Facebook fan page, uh, the African history network. Okay, and uh, here's the uh, you, you can watch the interview there and follow Anthony T. Browder on Facebook. Also, Anthony T. Browder on Facebook as well. All right. Now, here is a uh, let me pull this up here. And I had to I had to go into my archives and because uh, I've had laptops that died on me, things like this. I have a number of external hard drives. I had to go into my archives to find some of these pictures um, that I that I had, uh, you know, in promoting the interviews I did with Renoko and things like this. Here's one right here, and it has his book Black Star: The African Presence in Early Europe, and he's in the uh, Hidden Colors Two documentary. I want to go to an excerpt of an interview I did with Renoko in uh this one is from i think this is from 2014 i was looking at one different 2017 i gotta find the full file so maybe tomorrow show i can share that one from 2017 but um in this one here we discuss uh the black madonnas in uh europe the black madonnas in europe uh this is from uh this is from April 17th, 2014 on the African History Network show. Okay. This was even, th th this was when I was on blog talk radio. So this is even before I got on the empowerment radio network. And before I had a, a, a eight channel mixer, I have a 12 channel mixer. Now this is before I had an eight channel mixer. This is before I had a, a sure microphone. I think I was using a headset at this time, plugging into the laptop. <laughs> okay. So the sound quality is much better. I've come a long way since blog talk radio days. All right, but let's let's go to this clip here. Came to be known in the history as the Chevalier de Saint George or the Saint Georges, and this is. And let me back it up a little bit. Uh, okay, let's back it up a little bit. You, you did, but your brother, it's oh, Joseph God. Boulogne, Joseph Boulogne, oh. and Joseph Boulogne. Came to be known in history as the Chevalier de Saint George or the Saint Georges, and this is an yeah. African who was born in Guadeloupe in the Caribbean on the mm -hmm. um, December twenty fifth, nineteen. I'm sorry, December twenty fifth, seventeen forty five, and he mm -hmm. became one of the great men in um, what's called the Golden Age of French history. And you have a number of people mm -hmm. like that who just stand out. There weren't many of them, but they were brilliant. People like um, Alexander Pushkin in Russia, or yes. people like Adolf Baden in Sweden, and Angelo Solomon in Austria, the Dumas mm -hmm. family in France. There was a man in Germany named Wil uh, Wilhelm Anton Amo, who graduated with a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Halle, 
I think, in Germany in 1796. So you have, <clears throat> even during the age of enslavement, you have a handful of Africans and men of African descent. You never find records of African women, but men of African mm. descent who managed to distinguish themselves in a very, I guess what could be called a very hostile environment, uh, at the very least a very lonely environment. And I, I find yeah. it fascinating. Sometimes people ask Absolutely. me, you know, why are these things important or why are these people important? Because any African who's able to excel in whatever endeavor, in an area where there are very few Africans and there's a hostility, a general hostility towards Africans, it makes for a remarkable story. We find people like um, Septimius Severus, the great mm -hmm. African emperor of Rome, or you find people like um, uh, St. Maurice, the African patron saint of the Holy Roman Germanic Empire. It's just really remarkable thing. So uh, thank you for mentioning Joseph Boulogne. And um, I certainly appreciate it, and I think a lot of sisters and brothers appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. If, you, if you want to know or if the audience wants to know, I'm in France right now, and it's um, mm -hmm. 3.35 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So if I sound subdued, <laughs> that's the reason oh. why. Okay, I thought it was PM there, but yeah, yeah, it is. They they are uh, like about six hours ahead of us, or something like that. Six, seven hours ahead. Of us. Okay, okay, definitely. Well, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna hold you long, brother. Uh, you know, I, I know what you, you know what you say when you email me. So that's we definitely appreciate you coming home, brother. <laughs> and when we do have international listeners, we have listeners in the UK, Japan, things like that. So we definitely appreciate it. But um, your article here, um, uh, April thirteenth, uh, Joseph. Uh, is it Boulogne? Boulogne. No, Boulogne. Boulogne. Okay. Um, for, first of all, it is a fascinating article, and I encourage everybody to read it. But it, it talks about the age of enlightenment in France. Okay, it, and he, it, it, um, his life is within that period of time, the 18th century. What is the age of enlightenment in France, if you don't mind sharing that with us? Well, I would say the age of enlightenment is due to the exploitation of African African people. France had begun to establish itself or reaffirm itself as a, a world colonial power. France is one of the biggest slave trading countries and they grew wealthy as a result of that. So there's a tremendous amount of wealth um, and it leads to what's called a golden age in France. Now you're looking at it from the perspective of the French, not the perspective of the Africans or the exploited people. But there's a lot of things going on, too, a, a lot of intellectual ferment. For example, I believe it's 1794 where you have the French Revolution. And the Haitian Revolution is a part of that. You know, so slavery yes. was abolished, you know, in all of the French colonies. And it wasn't, I think, if I have my history correctly, it was um, reinstituted as a result of the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte. But when people mm -hmm. talk about uh, folks like... Um, Robespierre and Marie Antoinette and Alexander Dumas, all of that comes out of this, this period in French history. But the basis of it, I don't think there's any doubt, is the exploitation of enslaved Africans. And this will ultimately lead, or actually it's already in the process of doing it, to the exploitation of Africa itself, so that slavery is abolished or enslavement is abolished, if you prefer that term. And it becomes more an issue, a direct issue of French colonialism in Africa. Of all the colonial powers, the French grab the most of Africa, closely followed by the British. Wow, wow. Um, you know, uh, when I also, I think now, correct me if I'm wrong, does it, that period of time, does that also have something to do with um, the uh, French philosophers and them trying to, an age of, of reason and uh, thought or critical thinking, something like that? Does, does that have something also to do with that period of time? Well, the greatest of the French philosophers during that period of time is, and remember, this is all new to me, too. I'm learning the whole process. The greatest of the French philosophers is Voltaire. And then yes. you're followed by a, a whole nother, you know, era from the time that um, 
the, the Chevalier de Saint Georges died. And by the way, the word Chevalier means knight in French. So he became a knight. Mm -hmm. His father was a, a French nobleman, and his mother apparently was the most beautiful woman, the mu most beautiful African woman in the island of Mart. Oh, I'm sorry, not Martinique, Guadeloupe. And mm -hmm. um, so at a young age, uh, Joseph Boulogne goes to France. And because of his father's status, he receives a superior education. You know, he was able to excel in many, many things. So on the one hand, his race is not a complete impediment, but he was only able to rise so far. Just to, mm -hmm. to get to your question, but add a bit more information, he's also known as uh, uh, the Black Mozart. And Mozart yes. actually had to come to him and ask him for a job. You know, most Joseph Boulogne was the head of the French, I think the French opera. And and Mozart actually came and asked him for a job. Um, Joseph Boulogne was an associate of Marie Antoinette. He set the the, um, the trends for fashion. And he's just a, a really remarkable person. So he dies around 1800, 1795, 1794, 1800, and 1795, that period of time. And right after that, you have the Dumas family. You have the, this family of African descendant people from Haiti. And of course, Alexander Dumas is the person who wrote The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo and The Man in the Iron Mask. And he is a contemporary of people like Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo is right. Charles Dickens of France. Victor Hugo wrote um, a book which was called uh, Notre Dame, which came to be known to history as the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And he also wrote the book Les Miserables, where he talks about Jean Valjean, the man who was arrested as a young person for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family and was given like a 20-year prison sentence, something like that and who eventually got out of prison and who spent most of the rest of his life trying to uh, duck and dodge from his criminal past. And so there's a discussion about class differences as well between the haves and the have-nots. And he's a contemporary of Emil Zola. And Emil Zola was the person who wrote a, about a famous trial called the Dreyfus trial. And so all of these, you know, people were talking about the status, not necessarily of black people per se, but the status of class and the haves and the have nots. So all of this is a part of this period that Joseph Boulogne is said to have lived. And the lesson, I suppose, um, that comes out of this for me is that all history is interconnected, just to yes. make a fantastic leap, for example, and something that I'm learning right now and trying to incorporate in my work is the fact that the civil rights movement in the United States, what we call the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, beginning in the mid-1950s, and that led to the Black Power Movement in the 1960s, mm -hmm. cannot be separated from the African Liberation Movement in Africa. Exactly. That Martin Luther King exactly. was a keen observer of the African Liberation struggle. That Dr. King went to Africa several times, and so mm -hmm. did Coretta Scott King, for that matter. Correct. And Dr. King Correct. was in Africa at the time of... Um, the independence of Ghana. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. went to Jamaica yeah. and spoke glowingly at the shrine of Marcus Garvey. And so there was a black power movement in Australia. There was a Garvey movement in Australia. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is, in a sense, with all of this is connect the dots and to show that black history is everybody's history, that you can't separate one from the other, and that all of these phenomena are interconnected. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I, I don't know if you know Professor Manu and Pim uh, out of California, yeah. man. But mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, because he, he has some. He has. I, I've some, done some interviews with him dealing with the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Man, Dr. Mm -hmm. King is one of the most misunderstood people in history. His legacy has just been totally distorted, and um, a lot of people don't know about him studying African history, him being a keen observer of the, the uh, uh, of Africa's liberation movements, things like this, that, that this, you know, totally not talked about when, when we talk about Dr. King. Um, yeah, uh, also, very quickly here, in, in this article, you also talk about uh, Code Nowhere, the Nowhere Law of Blacks. Um, it, talk about that a little bit, because when we hear about the French, we hear about Paris, France, and things like this, but we don't hear about 
them oppressing African people that much. I guess those who really study African history, we know about French and the colonies, things like this. But in general, you really don't hear about this, uh, about the French. Well, no, I I suppose not. You hear stories about people like Josephine Baker or people Mm -hmm. like Richard Wright and Langston Hughes. All of them came to France. They lived in France, one of Richard Wright's daughters. And, of course, for those who don't know Richard Wright, we're talking about the author of books like Black Boy, Native Mm -hmm. Son, classical African-American literature, you might say. So in many ways, I think a lot of African-Americans, at least, have viewed France and Paris in particular as a haven uh, against white supremacy. And I suppose for African-Americans, that may be true to some extent. You know, I've rarely encountered, uh, you know, overt racism in France. I've been coming here for over 10 years now, and um, I like it here. It's a good experience. Lots of Africans mm-hmm. here, lots of museums, great public transportation. Expensive, but beyond that, it's not a bad place. But for Africans from the continent of Africa itself, or Africans who don't have money, Africans who don't have what are, what are generally known as papers, you know, it's a hell on earth. And let me add, too, that each colonial power employed different techniques mm-hmm. for dealing with their colonial subjects. And one of the things that the French did was to incorporate a sense of French identity, mm-hmm. however false and frivolous that might be. You know, I meet people even now from countries like, Democrat, not Democratic Republic of Congo, but Congo Brazzaville or French Congo, you know, or, or Gabon or Central African Republic, countries that have been at least on paper independent for 50 years or more, who go around saying, I'm French. You don't mm-hmm. encounter sisters and brothers from Jamaica or Nigeria or Ghana, you know, um, as poor as some of these countries are, although the material wealth is, you know, should make them very wealthy. You don't hear these sisters and brothers going around saying, I'm English. But the French did a marvelous job. You know, when I say marvelous, I'm saying that with some degree of sarcasm. I'm applauding my enemy to an extent. They did a a wonderful job in incorporating a sense of French identity. And so people, in many cases, feel like their loyalty is to France. And then the Dutch Mm -hmm. did their own particular job. And the Germans and the Belgians and the Portuguese and the Spanish. For example, the Portuguese developed a group of people called the assimilados, you know, who were largely the offspring of the Portuguese and Africans and put them in charge. And so the French are, are very similar to that. The French were some of the most effective colonizers, very, very racist. And a lot of us just don't know about that. And that's something that troubles me a great deal. You know, I spend a lot of time on Facebook as well as you know. And one mm-hmm. of the things that strikes me in fact i i should do you know i've got several other articles coming up uh soon in the land of black star but i see their format and one of the the things that they do is they might say 10 you know great africans who they need to make a movie about or the five africans who we need to emulate or five classical civilizations that weren't in africa but were black things like that but one of the things if i ever get the time I like to write is like, what are the greatest myths of Africa? I don't know how I jump to this point, but one of these myths might be (laughs) that Africa is not named after a Roman general Mm -hmm. or that the reason Africans are scattered around the world is not because of of Pangea. (laughs) And the other thing is, I was going to make, and I want to say this and then I'll shut up for a moment. I guess I'm sleep deprived. Is um, oh my God! I for, <laughs> it's almost four o'clock in the morning. Um, you were talking about the myths. The, yeah, uh, I was talking about the uh, myths. But there's one myth in particular that I wanted to introduce. I guess it'll come back to me, brother. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But Pangea is a good one. I can email you some things. Uh, yeah, Africa was named after Syria. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here go, here go, I got it. Maybe the thing that frustrates me on Facebook the most is when I make a post and people say, I didn't know that. No, they don't say I didn't know that. 
they typically say, they didn't tell me that. Uh, we didn't learn this in school as if it's the responsibility of other people to teach us our history, that we have become so intellectually lazy, let's be real, and so psychologically mm -hmm. dependent that even though many of us say that the European is the enemy of Africa or Africans, that we still expect that enemy to teach us our history. And when you look at that, you realize how slavery, <coughs> excuse me, and colonialism has reduced us psychologically as a group of people. So anyway, I could ramble on and on, you know, about that, mm. but those are some so points right. I wanted to make in attempting to yeah. address your question in some way, form, or fashion. Well, you know, you're right about that. And, and see, what happens is, especially when you go to the college level, you go through college and then you get your degree, you get your bachelor's degree, you get your master's degree, and you don't learn this information. And, and, and you thought that you had a good education. You graduated from Princeton or Notre Dame or Wayne State University. You thought you had a good education, and you didn't learn any of this. And it becomes shocking. You know, let's not just look at high school level. Let's look at college level. Okay, you pay all this money. And, and, and you ain't, you didn't learn any of this stuff. Okay, that can be, become very shocking to people. You know, luckily, it was it was in, in college where I started really studying African history. Okay, so I got, you know, at least some of this information, and I studied on my own. So when I took my first African studies classes, I was talking about things that the professors didn't know about. Kind of shocked the hell out of me. <laughs> but but still, I still learn things from them. But you know, I was dropping stuff on them that they didn't know. So, well, uh, I, I think you can't teach what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And for Absolutely. the most part, we don't know what we don't know until we begin to know it. I sound a little <laughs> bit like a philosopher now. No, but you're correct. Very true. And all of this is a part yeah. of the African liberation process. I think Garvey mm -hmm. said it best in terms of freeing your mind. You know, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Nobody can free us but ourselves. That Bob Marty later picked up on and incorporated into the lyrics of a song. And so yeah. I, I just think, in, in a sense, I suppose it's relevant that in spite of everything that we've gone through, <clears throat> that we're here to have this conversation and talk Absolutely. about these things. Not only, Absolutely. you know, is it, um, the other thing, it, it can generate a tremendous amount of anger, mm -hmm. you know, and even mm -hmm. hatred. You know, once you begin to realize what has happened to us and you didn't know about it, you know, I remember when I was a university freshman or sophomore and I began to read about lynchings, and I it was just furious. And if you had asked me what motivated me at that time, I would have said hatred for white people. But fortunately, right. I went through that phase, and I was able to channel that energy. And that's another message that I think that we need to give our people. If you're just going to be angry, you know, you're not effective. But if you're able to channel that anger, that excitement, that emotion in a positive direction that will uplift your community, then ultimately it turns out to be a good thing. So people like you and the work that you're doing um, in an unorthodox fashion, putting this information out there, it's invaluable. Oh, thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. We, and we appreciate you definitely. Uh, we're going to shift gears here into this other article that you wrote, and then we're, we're going to wrap it up early uh, uh, for you uh, uh, also. Uh, we're we're going to wrap it up. Um, okay. so don't worry about that. Oh, okay. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, the Professor Kaba Kamene, also known as Booker T. Coleman, I do a show with him every Wednesday night, okay? Um, and uh, he, he, he uh, gave me this quote. And uh, also Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, when I had him on about three weeks ago, he, he gave me this quote also. This is from Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, Napoleon said, uh, quote, my decision to destroy the authority of the blacks in St. Dominique, Dominique or Haiti is not so much based on consideration of <coughs> commerce and money as on the need to block forever the march of the blacks in the world. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I'm familiar with it. You know, I posted it okay. a few times on Facebook myself. I'd like to find the okay. source of it. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. 
I agree. I, agree. Uh, I got to ask Brother Copper where he got it from. Uh, uh, to see, and, and also Dr. David M. Hotel. It's interesting they both had that, so I have to see where they got that from. But I find that very interesting. Um, your article, March 19th, uh, on AtlantaBlackStar.com. And everybody, please check out the website. They have tremendous information. I've talked to uh, Brother Andre Moore, I think it is, with Atlanta Black Star. I'm, I'm going to be doing some things with them also. But this article here, Invasion, Theft, Rape, Murder, the Aboriginal Holocaust in Tasmania. Um, you know, we don't hear a lot about Tasmania, and we don't hear uh, e even we hear even less about the Africans in Tasmania. But 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 tell us, uh, you know, briefly about this. Well, there is a place called Tasmania. <clears throat> it's not mm -hmm. just something that you hear in the cartoons. Tasmania, Tasmania is devil. A, yeah, is an island off the southeast coast of Australia. Australia mm -hmm. is the largest inhabited continent in the world, permanently inhabited continent. Antarctica would officially qualify, but Antarctica doesn't have a, a history of, of, of human population, mostly the people there who are scientists. The people in Antarctica today are scientists, but Tasmania is an island about the size of Ireland or West Virginia, and it's been inhabited for at least the last 35,000 years, I suspect more, by black people. <laughs> they are the descendants of Africa. Everybody's the descendants of Africa. And that they, um, these short statured black people, have nappy hair, happy to be nappy hair, settled there and live in what seems to be peace and harmony. I think there are two groups of black folk there. I think one is called the Palawa, P A L L L W A. No, I think it's P A L L A W A. And I think the other group is Pakana, I believe that's the name, P-A-K-A-N-A. -A. And they lived in peace and harmony, had a very, very basic and rudimentary human technology. For example, they've never found any evidence of farming there, as we know it today, or no evidence of um, fishing, or even the domestication of fire. So these sisters and brothers were isolated there, perhaps 10,000, I don't know how many. And then around 1800, the British came. Actually, they came in the 17th century. You have a man named a Dutchman, mm -hmm. named Abel Jansen Tasman. He settled there or landed there. And that's who um, the island is named after, Abel Jansen Tasman. And after that, it was called Tasmania. And then the French came in the, your friends, the French. I say that with great sarcasm in the 18th century. Right. And then the real catastrophe came when the British came. And this is around 1800, 1801. And the British took the land. Tasmania was established as a British prison settlement or prison colony. And so the worst, the most horrendous of the British criminals were taken to Tasmania, not the mainland, Australia itself. And they got loose. And they slaughtered those sisters and brothers. And then, the, you know, a conscious decision was made just to take the land for the British. The British to even deny the humanity of these people. And so most of them, from around 1801 to 1876, were rounded up, killed, and a few remnants uh, were put in a, a what could be called a concentration camp at a place called Oyster Cove, which I visited. And the reason I wanted to write that article in particular, that you know, I talked to Andre a few months ago, and he asked me to start writing for the Atlanta Black Star, and I was honored to do it. I think it's a great um, publication or a great website. Yes, it is. Um, mm -hmm. a great source is because I wanted to, <clears throat> just as I was mentioning a few minutes ago in my sleep delirium, to help destroy some of the mythology around it so that people have been going around saying all the Tasmanians were wiped out. And I used to say that until I knew better. And then I went to Australia and I went to Tasmania and I met them. And they weren't wiped mm -hmm. out. All the full bloods were killed or eventually died. But in this process, the British captured uh, Aboriginal Tasmanian women. And I know some people object to the word Aboriginal, so I won't use it. I'll say indigenous or black Tasmanians. They captured some of the women and used them as sexual slaves. And children were born from those unions. So that the Aboriginal, um, there I go again, the indigenous Tasmanians of today are a highly mixed group of people with a lot of problems. You know, their children were taken away from them so that you have issues like uh, big issues, domestic violence, 
um, <laughs> substance abuse. You know, you have the stolen generations. These are the generations of indigenous children who were taken away from their parents and raised as slaves or in a slave-like condition. And these things haunt the sisters and brothers in Tasmania today. So it was an article that I was really pleased to write. It's really a rehash of articles I've been writing over the last 20 years. And I'm happy to say that that was the first article <clears throat> of mine that was published by the Atlanta Black Star. Right. right. All right. All right. So we're going to pause it right there. Uh, uh, we're going to wrap wrap this show up today. And what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll share some more of this interview that I did with Renoka Rashidi. This this interview was from um, April 17th, 2014. I did this interview April 17th, 2014. Renoka Rashidi, uh, the Black Madonnas of Europe. OK, I have this on YouTube. It's um, also, you know, we have all these shows archived on Blog Talk Radio. That's why I upload. I've had Blog Talk Radio. I've had this channel. I've had I've had the Blog Talk Radio channel since 2010, I think it is. So we have over a thousand archive episodes there of the African History Network show. I've interviewed everybody from um, Darren Dewitt Henson, who was Lamb on Soul Food. Now he's on the show, The Family Business on BET. I've interviewed Renoka Rashidi, Dr. Leila Africa. Bernadette Stannis, Thelma from Good Times. Uh, of course, Dr. Leonard Jeffries and uh, Professor James Small, and Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, Dr. Riketti. I mean, I've interviewed some of everybody. So uh, we'll share some more of this on the show tomorrow. Uh, while that interview was playing, I was uh, showing you some articles that um i was showing you some articles that uh, renoko has written and you can read these we have this is at uh atlantablackstar.com so the last one he was talking about invasion theft rape murder the aboriginal holocaust in tasmania that was from march 19th 2014 march 19th 2014 and then uh you have uh this one is a fantastic article june 1st 2014 Moors, Saints, Knights, and Kings, the African presence in medieval and Renaissance Europe. And in this uh, article, he also talks about it. Now, this is St. Maurice right here. This is a picture of St. Maurice, who became the patron saint of Germany. He was a Moor. Um, in this article, he also talks about his, uh, and now this is Tariq, okay, uh, uh, Tariq Ibn Ziyad, um, in Jebel Tariq, uh, Tariq's mountain is who it, it, that's who the rock of gibraltar is named after jebel tariq okay tariq's mountain tariq ibn ziyad uh the bold uh in 711 a.d the bold tariq crossed the straits and disembarked near a rock uh promontory uh which from the day which from that day since has borne his name jebel tariq tariq's mountain or gibraltar the rock of gibraltar is named after uh, the African general Tariq Ibn Ziyad, Tariq Ibn Ziyad, who was a Moor. Um, on the in August 711 AD, Tariq won paramount victory over the opposing European army. On the eve of the battle, Tariq is alleged to have roused his troops with the following words: "My brethren, the enemy is before you." Let's show this here. "My brethren, the enemy is before you." The sea is behind. Whither would you, whither would ye fly? Follow your general. I am resolved either to lose my life or to trample on the prostrate king of the Romans. Okay, so uh, check out this article also. This is a fantastic article. I've posted this a number of times throughout the years on our fan page, the African History Network. Uh, Moors, Saints, Knights, and Kings, the African presence in medieval and Renaissance Europe. Um, and we'll talk about the, this information in the coming days. Uh, this one here, Joseph Ballone, uh, about Joseph Ballone. Um, uh, Joseph Ballone, the Chevalier, uh, uh, Chevalier uh, de St. George's of France. 
That's from April 13th, 2014 for AtlantaBlackStar.com. Now, there was another one that I pulled up. Uh, oh, this one here. This deals with the world of uh, Sakanoya, uh, uh, no, Tamaram, Tamaramro, uh, Black Shogun of early Japan. Okay. The Black Shogun of early Japan. And this uh, shows the black presence in early Japan. That's from AtlantaBlackStar.com also. There was uh, one article here I've talked about a number of times before, especially during African American History Month and during like uh, uh, April when we deal with the assassination of Dr. King. Uh, this one here is How Steel Sharpened Steel, How Steel Sharpened Steel, the connection between the civil rights movement and African independence movements. And this is something that we'll deal with in um, my, my new 10 week online course from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And this deals with how the on the um, the Civil Rights Movement was taking place at the same time as the African Liberation Movement on the continent of Africa. And we were watching their movement they were watching ours and African nations were declaring their independence from uh, their colonizers, European colonizers, starting with Ghana in 1957. OK, starting with Ghana in 1957. Now, here is I, I have the picture. I got to see which hard drive is on, which computer is on. But it's a picture of Dr. King and Kwame Nkrumah together. 1957. If we look at this article here. Uh, where is it? Um, this article I have pulled up. It's from um, Birth of a New Nation, Martin Luther King on Ghana. And it shows a picture of Dr. King with uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Prime Minister of Ghana in 1957. OK, this one right here. So Ghana wins his independence in 1957 from Great Britain. Dr. King goes to Ghana to celebrate with Kwame Nkrumah. And he goes back to Ghana each year on the anniversary of Ghana's independence. Uh, this picture right here. See, Dr. King studied Africa. He kept up with the developments on the continent of Africa and the African liberation movement. Martin Luther King Jr. and Ghana Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah, 1957. Um, and th th this article is birth of a new nation, Martin Luther King on Ghana. This is from, uh, Philly, uh, Philadelphia Tribune, Philly tribe, Philly trib.com. Okay. Um, Dr. King, uh, in 1957 said, Ghana has something to say to us. It says to us first that the oppressor never voluntarily gives freedom to the oppressed. The oppressor never freely give, the oppressor never voluntarily gives freedom to the oppressed. You have to work for it. Dr. King stated upon his return to the United States in 1957, the birth of a new nation, uh, uh, the birth of a new nation sermon at Alabama's historical Dexter Avenue Baptist church. Dr. King went on to say, and it, and if in and the people of the Gold Coast or Ghana had not stood up persistently revolting against the system, it would still be a colony of the British Empire. Freedom is never given to anybody for the oppressor has you in domination because he plans to keep you there and he never voluntarily gives it up. And that is where the strong resistance comes. Privilege, privileged classes never give up their privileges without strong resistance, end quote. Invited by Ghana's newly elected prime minister, Kwame Nkrumah, Dr. King's trip uh, was coordinated by small by small group by small groups of African-Americans, including Westchester born uh, Cheney University and Pennsylvania alum Bayard Rustin. Uh, for Dr. King, his visit to Ghana proved to be a pivotal to be pivotal as his world view evolved okay so read this article here uh birth of a new nation 
Martin Luther King on Ghana. Okay, January 9th, 2017. All right. Uh, and then there was uh, also this article here. Distinguished uh, Africans in the European resistance. A European Renaissance, distinguished, distinguished Africans in the European Renaissance, part one of a series of great African men in history. This is from September 28th, 2014, Renoko Rashidi for AtlantaBlackStar.com. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, be sure to register for the 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays. Uh, this is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. 1865 to 1968 and we we also deal with the african liberation movement on the continent of africa and how these movement movements were connected uh we deal with history from 1865 the last year of the civil war and the 13th amendment and slavery ending we go throughout reconstruction 1865 to 1877 through the jim crow era late 1890s and plessy versus ferguson 1896 into the new century um and we deal with the great migration in 1915 and 1970 six million african americans migrate out the south and up north uh we deal with world war one world war ii the red summer 1919 uh the impact of the uh great pandemic the spanish flu pandemic of 1918 1919 and 1920 when the u.s loses 675,000 americans to the spanish flu pandemic pandemic the great pandemic of 1918 we go through world war one what happens after world war one and we deal with the gi bill the new deal all of that deindustrialization of the inner city building of the uh suburbs uh african americans being locked out of a lot of these government programs to buy homes in the suburbs as well uh we deal with the uh civil rights movement black power movement okay so visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and scroll down the page. You'll see the information for uh, the radio show. Our radio show, we have six days a week. And uh, click right here to register here. It takes you to the next page. Click on Enroll. As soon as you uh, enroll, you can start watching the uh, archive content that we have. And uh, the class meets on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um and we do the sessions live you can watch from around the world also okay and you can see me i can't see you so you can be in pajamas what have you. you you don't have to worry about getting dressed up or anything like that click right here on enroll as soon as you register you can start watching content classes uh, on sale 130 dollars regularly uh 80 all right we just posted a link here you can register for that uh, we have to get out of here. And also, if you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. We're here six days a week. Um, this helps us pay some of the bills, et cetera, finance the show. All right. And this is our official Cash App account, dollar sign the AHN show, S H O W. Um, and it shows my name, Michael, and it shows my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network cash app accounts. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right knowledge corrects wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace.